So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Laura Mori from the Brigham Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston. And I'm here with Tim Gardner from Christiana Care in Delaware. Yes, Tim. good morning. Um, and we've just come from an incredible uh, late-breaking clinical trial session called Pioneering the Future of Heart Interventions. Um, and I thought this was a great example of having you know, surgeons and interventional cardiologists, general cardiologists, discussing some really challenging issues. Sure. Yeah, I mean, there were some really interesting sessions with somewhat unexpected, uh, unanticipated uh, findings in, in these reports. The first uh, trial that, uh, that we talked about was the ART trial, which is a randomized, multi-center international randomized con comparison study of single versus uh, bilateral mammary artery grafting. And this was the one that really surprised me. Mm -hmm. This is five-year follow-up. It's only interim analysis. It's a 10-year it's a follow-up uh, trial. But uh, I expected uh, there to be uh, benefit uh, demonstrated with bilateral mammary artery grafting. You know, we, we have, as a surgical community, we uh, certainly accepted the fact that the best graft that we can construct surgically is the, uh, the internal mammary graft to the LAD. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, evidence that the uh, grafts, the mammary artery grafts, hold up better, are more durable, stay patent longer than saphenous vein grafts. So it seems something of a non, of a no-brainer that the uh, the right mammary artery, when uh, constructed to the the circumflex or even the right coronary artery, would would uh, provide some additional uh, benefit. Mm -hmm. But they didn't, they didn't see that at five years. There was really no difference between the two groups. And actually, the uh, patients in the patient group that had bilateral grafting, there was a much higher incidence of sternal wound problems. So that's been sort of the bugaboo uh, among surgeons, uh, you know, reluctance to uh, use the right mammary because of concerns about sternal wound healing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think that it does uh, make us uh, look more carefully about the use of the, the uh, bilateral or the, the right mammary as well as the LAD. I thought it was interesting in our discussion, Dr. Craig Smith, a very experienced uh, surgeon from New York, said, you know, in fact, I always use the mammary, double mammary, mm -hmm. when, when, whenever uh, appropriate. So I, I think that is our, still our bias. Um, I, I w would take away from this study that I really need to be careful about recommending bilateral grafting to patients who have some uh, more comorbidity, such as diabetes, obesity, chronic lung disease, uh, where the, the healing of the sternum could be a problem. Yeah. Uh, but that still for long-term durability, especially in younger patients that, that need bypass grafting, that arterial grafts in general are better than yeah. relying on vein grafts. I guess to play a little bit devil's advocate, I was really surprised though that there were no signals. Of, you'd think at five years there yes. might be some signal of something positive yes. associated with what you know what I think a surgeon expects, which is a greater patency. So no difference in revascularization, no difference in MI rates associated with the bilateral uh, procedure. Um, so I think you know, as a, as a referring cardiologist to surgeons, I, I, you know, I think it probably highlights the importance of uh, really having a good discussion with our patients about the options as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what their expectations are, because it's a matter of weighing this upfront, um, granted, rare event of sternal complications, yeah, but higher. Uh, up to 2%. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I think the other thing that may be, the other phenomenon we may be seeing is that patients who have coronary bypass grafting are maybe having much more effective secondary prevention. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, the use of statins, aspirin, lifestyle change, no, no more smoking, et cetera, mm -hmm. may, may be providing better long-term durability of vein grafts. Mm -hmm. And that may be part of this. Yeah, and that's a good well. thing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's a great thing if optimal medical yes. therapy can really reduce the rates of complications yes. in both types of surgeries. Um, but as you said, the final results we won't have until another five years from now, and I think that'll be very interesting. Yeah, and it is, this was the, the only uh, randomized control trial that, that I'm aware of with this. I mean, there are lots of reports of superiority of, of uh, better outcomes with bilateral mammaries rather than single, but this is going to have an impact on the guidelines and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great to see this level of evidence. Yes. 
Um, so the second study was the future trial, yes. um, which was very interesting. I think represents a challenge um, in some some clinical trials where you have a study that was um, ostensibly supposed to enroll 1,800 patients um, and look at patients with multi-vessel disease, two or three vessel disease, um, and randomize them either to an FFR-guided revascularization yes. approach or just angiographically guided. And they could have been candidates for PCI or for bypass. They all had to have LED disease and were stable patients. Yes. Um, and the DSMB halted the enrollment after less than half the patients had been enrolled right. based on a mortality concern. Yes. Um, and they saw about twice the rate of mortality um, in the patients who were assigned to the FFR arm. Um, that being said, I think it left us with a lot of questions um, because um, those mortalities were not um, clearly related to the procedures, not even to the FFR. Yes. And so understanding how that was a you know a reason for not continuing to randomize. Um, you know, it's it's a challenge um, for a DSMB who sees a p value, how to interpret that. Yeah. And it's a, it's really hard to know what to do next. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I don't think the DSMB had any choice but mm -hmm. to uh, suspend the trial. I mean, I, I think that when you see that kind of signal, you just have to step back. Uh, and it, as of course, as it turns out, when those patients were followed longer, the the uh, significance of the of the mortality uh, issue with the FFR patients d didn't hold up, mm -hmm. at least statistically, exactly. and and that's the unfortunate aspect of mm -hmm. this. But I, I, you know, I mean, I respect their uh, decision. Yeah. And but I think the you know are, are there other aspects of this trial that would make you a little less confident about uh, relying on FFR? I mean, you know, I, I can remember for years we have been encouraged and expected as surgeons to do complete revascularization. Mm -hmm. So we base completeness of revascularization on our uh, angiographic assessment mm -hmm. of, of stenoses. Um, and you know, so our default mode is graft every appropriate art uh, artery that seems to have a, um, mm -hmm. a significant lesion. Right. Uh, and you would assume that if you use FFR, FFR guided revascularization strategies, you would be you would be doing fewer graphs, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say? Right, I would agree. I mean, I wonder if some of that is because of the high bar that you set for having a second operation, whereas from a PCI perspective, you may be willing yeah. to go back in yeah, that, and have another another that, that, procedure. That's an excellent point. That's yeah. a very, very good point. But, you know, I think I think the results of that study, because the mortalities were not driven by the FFR procedure and because we have lots of data preceding that from the FAME trials yes. showing that FFR is safe, um, in, in my mind, it doesn't change the, the value of FFR as we know it right now for guiding uh, which lesions are functionally significant. And I think it's still an open question about patients who there really is equipoise between PCI and cabbage. Um, maybe they have three vessel disease that is, and, and they're not a diabetic patient, um, and it's feasible to treat them right. um, with uh, PCI or cabbage. I think there's still a question of whether we should be using FFR to help decide you know, how much needs to be revascularized. Yes. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have the final answer uh, from right. this study. Um, so, you know, there will be other studies looking at th these sorts of questions like FAME-3. Right. Um, and it may be helpful to really focus on the population where there's more equipoise between the two, um, whereas, you know, the future study was primarily a PCI right. uh, patient population. Right. Yeah, so, so you're, your interest and commitment to uh, documenting significant lesions uh, using FFR is is, un, you know, is not lessened by this. No, and I think there's still an open um, question that we should keep on investigating. Sure. Yeah. No, I understood, and and the discussion, Dr. Arano, really made that point as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even the presenters as well. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, so the third study was a really complicated one. Uh, the uh, open label randomized control multicenter study exploring uh, essentially the use of NOAX or uh, rivaroxaban uh, and and versus various uh, treatment uh, uh, regimens that included primarily warfarin. Mm -hmm. So that was I, I thought that Dr. Gibson masterfully presented an extremely complex trial, but uh, my my 
takeaway message is that there is some suggestion that eliminating warfarin in patients with both stents who have AFib may be reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really interested in your, you're, you're the expert, you see those patients much more than I we do. We see them. Um, it's interesting because these patients who have atrial fibrillation and get coronary stents are a big worry for us as cardiologists and interventional cardiologists because we, we know that they need anticoagulation to prevent stroke. We also know they need dual antiplatelet therapy to avoid stent thrombosis right. and myocardial infarction. But do they really need all three of those together? And what do we do with the, with the uh, novel oral anticoagulants? Yes. They should be safer. You know, in atrial fibrillation, the NOACs have a reduced rate of bleeding and in some cases better efficacy than, than warfarin. And we know for our patients there's a strong preference because right. they make things so much simpler. Um, and so it's a real challenge. Um, it's only five to eight percent of the patients who present for stents who are also on an anticoagulant for atrial fibrillation, but they are such a central um, focus of concern for us. Yeah, about, and, and about the, this the balance. major concern is bleeding, is it not? It's not yeah. not as much the stroke. Uh, well, I would say both. So so there's a concern for bleeding, um, and that's exactly what was addressed in the Pioneer study. Uh, but there's also a concern about if you reduce the, um, the, the regimen, are you going to then have a higher risk of stroke or stent thrombosis right. or MI? And, um, and this really gets to the heart of the Pioneer study um, and the other studies that are looking at similar questions that are ongoing right now. So um, the NOACs have a lower risk of bleeding. And so it, it makes sense that if you do a randomized trial, randomizing a NOAC to warfarin, you're going to see a lowered risk of bleeding. In fact, the Pioneer looked at even lower doses than the standard doses right. of rivaroxaban. So I think it was expected that we would see lower risks of bleeding in the two rivaroxaban arms, and, and they saw that profoundly, um, and that impacted lower rates of hospitalization as well. Right. Um, but what we don't really know, because there was only 700 patients per arm, is whether, um, whether it's as effective as the standard of care, which uh, in their trial was warfarin plus aspirin right. and a P2Y12 inhibitor, usually clopidogrel. Um, so I think we're left wondering, I mean, it does give us the best data that we have so far on any triple therapy uh, versus, you know, with a NOAC versus warfarin. Right. Um, and so I think it will influence care. Um, we, you know, more and more of our patients come in on NOACs and now we can say, well, this is a regimen that has been studied. Um, I don't know if we know really which of the two regimens of either the low rivaroxaban plus dual antiplatelet therapy yeah. or the low with P2Y12 alone right. is better because it really wasn't power to look at that. Yeah. And, and actually, neither of those doses, are they labeled for, for that? for that usage? I mean, no. I, I think that's another issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're no, available, but they're not labeled. Yes. I think this is an area where um, <clears throat> it's, it's, uh, we have to use our medical judgment, yes. and the evidence is better than it was a day ago, yeah. but it's still not complete. Yeah, but it, it is a provocative study, and you know, f uh, focusing on, as you pointed out, a, a particularly troublesome or challenging group of patients. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. But it certainly generated a lot of interest. Yeah, and I think it's a direction we'll be going in because although warfarin is the standard, it's not really the gold standard. You know, yes. it's just something that's been historical. Yes, so, and yeah. as someone said, it's not a very good drug. You, know, yeah. you hate to use it and yeah. hate to take it. Yeah. Right. I mean, it actually has been one of the reasons why people have favored uh, uh, bioprostheses versus you know, uh, mechanical valves. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's certainly been the, the fear of, of warfarin. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. But a little off the topic there. But. <laughs> so then the final study in the group was the Gary study, which wasn't a randomized trial. It was a description of the German um, experience with TAVI yes. um, and surgical aortic valve replacement right. for patients uh, with aortic stenosis. What did you think of that? It was a real challenge, I think, that we've seen in, in um, when we compare catheter-based interventions to surgical, that there's just such strong selection bias. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think it's inevitable. I think the, the good thing about the trial is that they've, they've had several years more experience, earlier experience uh, with uh, TAVR than, than we have here in the States. 
<clears throat> and obviously there's a lot of interest in the intermediate risk patient. I think the trial or the, their analysis of their database was very, very good. Um, they uh, were able to really characterize the, the intermediate risk patients. I would say that they, they probably, 90% of their patients were in that, that risk category. And I, I, although I was sort of surprised when I saw the results, when I thought about it and when I heard the presentations and the discussion, I wasn't so surprised that that patients, even at intermediate risk, who are considered older, more frail, uh, you know, are, are going to be treated with uh, TAVR, with mm -hmm. the catheter therapy. Mm -hmm. And that the surgical candidate today in that population of patients is really one who is, is judged by the heart team to be somewhat at lower risk, despite right. the trying to match the, the, the risk scoring. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think that it is a, an important uh, observational study and gives us some good insight. And, uh, you know, although we're able to offer catheter therapy, uh, there's still the underlying sort of risk profile of patients, and in particular, you know, the older, more frail individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting to have that lead time that we can see what's happening in yes. Germany. It's it's going to be soon um, upon us here as well in the United States of figuring out how best to address this patient population in the U.S. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think that, I, I you know, I wonder if you have an intermediate risk patient uh, who may be mid-60s, uh, you know, how is the heart team going to you know, uh, adjudicate that patient in mm -hmm. terms of the, the recommendation for, for intervention. And I, I think that if that patient is a low risk patient for surgery, mm -hmm. um, the, the, you know, they may be better off uh, having the surgery, mm -hmm. although. At least until we understand the durability of, of the transplant. Yeah, I mean, that's the, other, that, that's the other big question mark mm -hmm. today, as, mm -hmm. as Craig Smith pointed out. Mm -hmm. Right. So all four interesting studies, yeah. you know, none of which uh, necessarily made, met the, all the expectations or at least the preconceived notions. Um, we uh, certainly the, the randomized art trial that, that showed no benefit despite the fact that, you know, we're all waving the flag for more arterial grasp mm -hmm. was probably the most surprising. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a, it's a whole, it shows a whole range of challenges when we're looking at complex patients, I think, but, yes. um, but really the collaboration across the different disciplines and yeah. thinking creatively about what kind of study design is going to get to the solution, I think, right. are some of the important themes. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I, I would just make the point that it's uh, great to see uh, the, uh, the cardiologists, especially the interventional cardiologists and the surgeons, uh, working closely and, and sort of the heart team concept continues mm -hmm. to be a, a goal for all of us. Mm -hmm. It's really central. Right. Yeah. Well, thanks very much. We've enjoyed um, reviewing the trials together with you um, and hope you enjoy the rest of the American Heart Association meeting. Thank you. Great. Thanks.